Hello everybody. Good evening to all of our viewers out there in the UK and the rest of Europe and to everybody else elsewhere in the world. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, whatever it is, wherever you are. So my name is Lucas Norton from the Jorvik Viking Centre and today on this live stream I'm joined by a very special guest, Asker Ingvaldsen, who is an archaeologist from the Viking Museum in Stockholm. And we are going to be chatting about an interesting selection of archaeological finds and exploring the emergence of Viking towns in Scandinavia. So hello, Asker. How are you this evening? Excellent. Happy to be here. Excellent. So to all of our viewers out there, if you have any burning questions that pop into your head during our discussion, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat box, as we will leave some time at the end of our discussion to answer as many of your questions as possible. So feel free to ask away, and when submitting your question, uh, please feel, feel free to tell us where in the world you are asking your question from. It's always fun to find out what exotic locations our live streams are being enjoyed in. So Aska, are you ready for my first question for our discussion? I am ready. Excellent. So we're going to go to the start of the Viking Age, uh, because here in England, we traditionally date the Viking Age as beginning in the year 793, with the Viking raid on Lindisfarne. Now that, of course, is in the middle of our Anglo-Saxon period over here, but that's a very Anglo-centric view of things, isn't it? What was going bit. on over in Scandinavia before the famous raid of 793? There are a lot of things going on, including some early urban developments that we'll get back to later. But any discussion on well, the start of the Viking Age here in Scandinavia, it comes down to a little bit of a difference between, well, if you ask three different archaeologists on their opinion of this, you might get four or five different answers. But what we all can agree on that way before the attack on Lindisfarne, there are activities that we'd recognize as Viking Age style activities there. And some of the evidence being, or what people bring up when talking about this, are the so called Helga relics or the sacred objects from there. And I believe you're putting up an image of them right now. I can yes. see them. They are lovely looking objects. Wow. <laughs> um, very exotic are, looking for the Vikings as well. Precisely. They are from, well, all over the world. Uh, the scoop looking thing we think is some kind of uh, baptismal or ritual scoop from possibly Egypt. Some people have claimed it to be Coptic. Uh, opinions differ on that. Uh, Eastern Mediterranean, most people agree on. The uh, well, uh, Bishop's Crozier, uh, we believe it's a Bishop's Crozier, is from Ireland, or at least in an insular style, and several objects decorated in a similar fashion have been discovered in locations in Ireland. But the most exotic one was probably the uh, so-called Helga Buddha. What do you think it's made? Uh, where do I think it's made, was that? Mm -hmm. uh, I would presume if it's a Buddha, somewhere in Asia, um, Central Asia, I, I believe there were some, some, some Buddhists in, in that area at this time, I think. <laughs> yes, it is actually made in, we think, uh, the Swat Valley, uh, modern-day Pakistan. And Interestingly, all of these objects have been found in what archaeologists term the open area next to the very generic sounding Building Group 2. However, the Building Group 2 has often been associated with um, ritual, uh, cultic, religious activities. I, I like to use air quotes in the discussions because it's so incredibly vague. What we do know is that someone tied a leather strap around uh, the neck and the left arm of the Buddha statue. So presumably it was meant to be carried around, displayed, possibly in the belt or on some kind of procession staff or something. Oh, that's interesting, because um, reenactors and our own staff at Yorvit, we're, we're always hanging all sorts of random things from our belts, <laughs> showing them off to each other. <laughs> things like, you know, look at my cool hairbrush or something. So um, that would be a... I guess like putting a souvenir from a, uh, a holiday somewhere far away, isn't it, on your <laughs> shelf, um, but you carry the shelf around with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So the dating on these objects are all 
pre-Viking Age, uh, pre-9th century. However, the context that they were found in is a bit iffy. And as has been pointed out, I believe the crozier was found together with a Viking Age sword pommel. So these may be used into the Viking Age, but it is likely that they came to, it's from a small island, very close to modern day uh, Stockholm called Helge, reasonably close to Birke as well. And they came there from well, before the Viking Age. However, what I like to discuss is our, well, our connection to Anglo-Saxon England during the Viking Age. And what I like to bring up usually is the Sutton Hoo burial mound. I assume you're familiar with that. Yes, yeah. It's ve very famous here in England, Sutton Hoo, yeah. And um, the helmet is one of the iconic uh, objects that people go to see down in the British Museum when they visit there. I, re I really need to get over there sometime. But the decoration on the Sutton Hoo helmet is nigh identical to decorations on several helmets found here, primarily in Sweden, but also in Norway, Denmark, and the Netherlands as well. And we here in Sweden, we even found the patrices, which we used to produce these copper alloy or tin, tin sheets, which were then put on the outside of the helmets. And I presume you've put up the image. They yes, are we have, yeah. quite interesting images. Yeah. I like the one with the horns on the helmets. Yes. The, the <laughs> rabbit ear thing. Let's get it out of the way. These are not horns. On preserved artifacts showing off this style, we see that they're in fact bird headed terminals. And due to some stuff that we'll get into slightly later, these are often associated with Hugin and Munin, the two ravens of Odin. Hmm, that's interesting. I'm glad they're not horned helmets. I like the Kugan and Mooning connection much better. <laughs> <laughs> it is. So, these are all very interesting, but if we bring up the Sutton Hoo image, you'll even see two gentlemen wearing the same kind of headgear. Oh, Presumably, yeah. these are helmets featuring these bird-headed terminals and the neck guard, similar neck guard to the one found on the Sutton Hoo helmet. Now, this is quite obviously a reconstruction. It's uh, owned by uh, Paul Mortimer, a great Anglo-Saxon reenactor. He pretty much wrote the book on helmets from this time period. And if you look at his eyes, or rather just above them, you'll notice some slight asymmetry in the eyebrows. Yes. The right eyebrow, the garnets there, these are semi-precious stones, uh, kind of blood red, purplish. They are backed with gold foil, and thus, Light, be it sunlight or firelight, would reflect off them. But on the left eye, the garnets in the eyebrow are not backed by gold foil. So they'd remain dull and dark. And we're pretty sure this is some kind of well, an aspiration towards the wearer taking on the role of Odin, or Wodan, the uh, mm. king of the gods. Let's put it like that. And I, I really love this helmet. And it, of course, well, it's dated from the 6th century, right? Uh, yes, I believe so, yes. Uh, from the, the East Anglian Kingdom, yeah. Precisely. And there are, of course, connections with Viking Age Scandinavia, or well, pre-Viking Age Scandinavia. And, in fact, in the castle of Bembera, I'm pronouncing it right, right? Uh, yes. Bebenberg in yes, Old Be English. <laughs> from uh, the last kingdom, Bebenberg, yes. Yes, don't quote <laughs> <laughs> Don't quote me on my old English pronunciations. I get it all from the audiobooks of Bernard Cornwall. But there, several individuals had been buried and had grown up in Western Scandinavia. So when the Scandinavians arrive at Lindelsfarn, they're not exploring this new strange land, as, as shown in the TV show Vikings, hmm. but rather they're attacking a soft target, which they know has a lot of wealth attached to it. But... Lindisfarne status as a first Viking raid was completely shattered about 15 years ago when, of all people, Estonian archaeologists uncovered something strange. It's an island off the western coast of Estonia called Sarama, uh, Ursel in Swedish. And there they found the remnants of a pair of vessels constructed in the same fashion as Viking ships. It's called Klink, Klinker, overlapping planks. Uh, Rivets, clench balls, all that jazz. 
these have been used as mass graves for a total of 40 individuals, most of them still wearing signs of a violent death. Decapitated heads, cloven bones, we, they even found arrowheads still embedded where ship plank and shield plank would have been, which is quite dramatic. And thanks to isotopic analysis, they were able to determine that almost all of these individuals had grown up in what is now Sweden, primarily the Mala River Valley, the greater Stockholm area. And these people were either part of or very closely related to the individuals buried in the Sutton Hoole style helmets here in the Mala River Valley. And probably the, the most dramatic would be the so called uh, Salme King. Uh, these burials, or these interred individuals, have been given various grave goods. Some of them have been given gaming pieces for the Viking Age board game known as Nematap, obviously slightly older than the Viking Age. But there was, only, was one or two king pieces found in the entire burial. And one of them had been placed between the jaws of one of the dead. He'd also been given a highly ornamented sword, a ring pommeled sword, and these swords are marks of a very high status leader, be it a chieftain, jarl, proto king. I, I don't really care what you call them, I just care that he, he was very important to the Scandinavians. And this shows us the importance of the Eastern route, as we come to call it, bringing back stuff such as, well, we'll actually get to that later. Towards this, these burials are dated to about 750. And this is also the earliest archaeological find of sail from well, Scandinavia. And this 750 date coincides sort of with the appearance of the first towns here in Scandinavia. I'm using the word town here, probably not all that accurate. They have about um, you know, 1,000, 2,000 people living there permanently, so they're hardly all that impressive. But for the period, they, though, in that region, and that's that's quite large, I would presume, then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. these are the first signs of urbanism that we see here in Scandinavia. And we prepared a map of some of them. Let's see, yeah, you've got uh, Jorvik there, of course. There so we you are. Guys <laughs> the Roman ruins, so you're cheating. Here in Scandinavia proper, where to start from the beginning. First out is Ribe, in what is now Denmark, the western coast there. And this is the earliest stages they are dated to about 710 or so. So well, almost 80 years before the attack upon Lindisfarne. Now, both uh, Birka and Heidebu, here to be, down is what is now Germany, during the Viking Age, which is part of Denmark. They're up and running by the second half of the 8th century. Heidebu might be slightly later, the datings on that vary. But all of these places, Heidebu, Ribe, Birka, Kaupang, they're all constructed with the ladder model. This means essentially you've got two streets running in parallel with the beach and with the rungs of the ladder connecting them and forming the plots where you put the, well, the houses, uh, the pit houses, the workshops. And these are workshops uh, where they produce stuff, but they're also signified by international contacts. And it's, this is one of the things that make us start the Viking Age in the middle of the 8th century here in Scandinavia. Uh, some people say 800. Discussion is ongoing. But this brings us to our second question, right? Yes, it does. So, so we've got that lovely build-up to the Viking Age there, then, with some very interesting uh, archaeological finds. Um, but, of course, here in England, we have uh, events like the Lindisfarne Raid, which are chronicled in our, by our monks over here. But I suppose in Scandinavia, you rely more upon the archaeological record. Um, exactly. So what exactly signifies the archaeological start of the Viking Age in Scandinavia? I presume there's not just like a piece of graffiti saying we raided Lindisfarne <laughs> today with a date on it. Um, unfortunately not, but rather it's this urbanism the usage of sail, uh, there's the pretty long process of going from, um, well, proto-Norse into old Norse. This is between the uh, years 600 to 800, and this also coincides with the changing from the elder Futhark to the younger Futhark. 
But There's a lot of confusion all... over the fox, isn't there, these days? Which is which and which is Viking? <laughs> there is. Please use, if you're doing anything with the Vikings, please use the young Futhark. Now, it's also a matter of uh, art styles. You guys have uh, the uh, Anglo Saxon art styles, and they're close related to the Scandinavian art styles. But it's towards, well, the end of the 8th century, we start seeing uh, the proper Viking Age art styles appearing. But modern discussions often focus on these emporia, these urban uh, expansions, if you will. I've marked a few more of them on the map. For instance, what is now Poland, we have Volin and Truso, the second one being very close to modern day Gdansk. But uh, the most important one is probably found slightly outside the Baltic Sea. Uh, it is in modern day Russia, a place called Stadio Ladoga or Aldegeborg, somewhere between modern day St. Petersburg and Novgorod, uh, not marked on the map there. This is uh, a early Scandinavian. Uh, colony. There's not only Scandinavians there, you also have the Baltic Finns, speaking essentially Viking Age Finnish or Estonian, and you have the Eastern Slavs. But the, this colony, or well, this town, Emporia, quickly becomes dominated by Scandinavian influence. And I really love the description, or the, the metaphor that an archaeologist called Neil Price put forward. And he compares it to the, well, the Wild West towns cropping up in the Americas in the 19th century. Moving quickly from a few tents or shelters for ship supplies to rudimentary buildings to a complete urban environment. Probably this very, very rough neighborhood, loads of unmarked graves. Uh, the only thing missing to complete the picture of the rough and tumble Wild West town are the tumbleweeds and the clinking of spurs. <laughs> Spurs are actually very common during the Viking Age. Un unfortunately, they don't clink musically like the uh, later Rondon Spurs do. I actually have a replica of some that were found at Jorvik, which are actually remarkably similar to the uh, the pair we've got on screen now. So I've got this one here, where uh, the, the leather wasn't found with the original, I believe. It's just the metal piece that survived. And I've also strapped the other one <laughs> onto a shoe here, so our viewers can see how it was actually worn. You can see how it straps around the underside of it, and that's the uh, bit for pricking your horse with. So very different to our Wild West Spurs, aren't they? <laughs> now, Spurs are obviously very important to the Viking Age Scandinavians, at least to the, well, the wealthy farmers and upwards, because horses are a big deal here. For instance, the first thing we do when we arrive over in your neck of the woods is to steal horses to ensure mobility for the raiding or the foraging parties, for instance, and of course, the scouts as well. Mm, that famously happened with the, the great heathen army in England. They arrived in uh, East Anglia first and proc procured lots of horses from uh, the king of East Anglia, came up here, captured York, then rode the horses back down and captured East Anglia <laughs> after that. So yeah, horses are a prime target, I would imagine, when you arrive in a new land. Of course, we don't only find military stuff from the Viking Age, but also a lot of well, hygienic stuff, even. Am I doing this in the wrong order? Oh, this is this is fine, yeah. Oh, perfect. Good, yeah. good. Uh, on the screen there, you should probably see uh, what we call an air spoon. Uh, they use instead of Q-tips uh, to, well, smarten up your ears and for digging out earwax. This is a very decorated piece. It's made out of silver lovely. with a partial gilding as well. So this would have been, you know, a, a status symbol. This is suspended from the brooch of or the brooches of a woman hanging from well, a yay here. Well, no, you can see it from the chest area. Mm. And on the front of it you see a what people or archaeologists interpret as a Valkyrie uh, serving mead in uh, Valhalla. But it could probably be, you know, just a housewife serving mead in a yeah. home with her guests. It's reminiscent uh, of stuff from the Gotland picture stones, isn't it? I believe. Precisely. Yeah, where you can see um, female figures around Odin holding horns, which they say might be Valkyries. So, yeah. And on the other side, you see some kind of uh, animal. We think it's 
a, a lion or at least a big cat judging from uh, the pose mm -hmm. and this of course brings into mind the connection between freya and cats supposedly she had a chariot drawn by two enormous cats yeah that's interesting because cats don't appear particularly often in, in the artwork i've come across from the viking age so that that's that's quite interesting to hear <laughs> on that spoon and uh it's it's so much lovelier than other ones i've seen before i've got a, a replica of a more typical one here so this one here is a uh, copper alloy and there are no valkyries and there are no cats <laughs> on this particular one but uh, other sorts of um, examples of hygiene equipment is here as well. Tweezers and presumably a pick for cleaning the, your nails of dirt as well. Precisely. That's uh, far less impressive than the, the lovely <laughs> example from Scandinavia there. I may have cherry-picked some. <laughs> uh, don't feel too bad. Uh, on the mention of cats, I really just have to talk about a mention or a reference in one of the... Icelandic sagas. They are recorded post-Viking age, but they presumably reflect some kind of oral tradition, possibly uh, similar to the ones from Viking Age Scandinavia. And there, uh, the Völva, the Ceres or the Sorceress, she wears catskin gloves. So this gives, you know, another layer to the uh, Valkyrie, Big Cat, Freya connection as mm, well. The connection the with uh, magic and Seder, isn't it there? Yes. Precisely. Mm. Freya being the one teaching Odin how to, uh, well, save, essentially. Mm. Now, of course, the probably the most iconic hygiene object from the Vikings would be uh, the comb. Tomes, yes. Very, very iconic. We are inundated with combs at the Orbic Viking Center. Uh, we've got replicas of some of the examples here. Uh, so not, not too dissimilar to the ones we're showing on screen at the moment there. Uh, I believe in, in in fragments, we have somewhere around something like 200, I want to say, from the Coppergate sites, and others have been found on other sites uh, across Viking Age York and other Viking sites elsewhere as well. Um, we also They're... have examples of these double-sided ones too, as well, which are often they'll have a fine side and a coarse side, so a bit, a bit similar to, to some combs you might see today. Yeah. Interestingly, we don't see those double-sided combs until, well, uh, the Middle Ages, essentially, here in Scandinavia. Hmm. Towards the very end of the Viking Age, you see these small rhombic double-sided combs, but that's a composite one, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yeah. It's interesting because it, it highlights how uh, there's so much diversity within the culture of the Vikings and the technologies and sets. Um, I think people have a very generic image of the Vikings in pop culture, but your Vikings in York are very different to your Vikings in Denmark, who are very different to your Vikings in the Baltic, different to Icelandic Vikings, etc. Different fashions and all sorts of different, different, different quirks to their local mm. culture. We often, you know, brush them under one comb, but a lot of the differences presumably come from archaeologically invisible factors. Mm. So important ethnic markets to them, completely invisible to us as outsiders, be we, uh, well, Anglo-Saxons during the Viking Age or modern day archaeologists. Uh, that's one of the reasons why most people think that only Danish Vikings went to England. Because you guys, you just can't tell them apart. And thus, you, when you're using ethnic terms, you'll stick to the term Dane, often translated as Dane. Mm. But we have plenty of evidence, for instance, of a large contingent of uh, people from what is now Sweden, tagging along with Sven Forkbid and King Knut the Great when they're attacking England towards the end of the 10th and early 11th centuries. Hmm. We also have uh, characters like uh, Eric Bloodaxe and Queen Gunhild, who are, of course, Norwegian, coming over to York, which is supposedly a, a Danish city. So um, <laughs> there's, there's, there's clearly a lot we, we, we're not quite working out fully just from the written record there, is there? <laughs> now, so uh, we don't just find artifacts from these towns, but also some remnants of, uh, well, let's call it human occupation. Do you want to put it up on screen? Yes, I think I know what you're referring to. <laughs> this is a, a coprolite. Uh, it's uh, currently ex exhibited in our museum, but it's alone from Stigetina Museum, a couple of miles north of here. 
And with it's found in the Viking Age context in the late Viking Age city of Sigtuna. We think it's human. We haven't done any analysis on it. But I believe you guys have something similar. Yes, I've actually got a replica of our most famous <laughs> example just here. Uh, the original is on display at Jorvik Viking Center. Uh, our example here is uh, called the Lloyds Bank Turd because it was found underneath the site of Lloyds Bank on a street called Pavement in York City Center. Uh, this is believed to be the largest example of uh, coprolites. That's the, the fancy word for poo stone <laughs> from a human being. Uh, and of course, we can learn all sorts of things about diets from it uh, by studying bran, seeds within it, and human health. Our, our one is, um, not this one, the rep this replica is nice and clean, <laughs> but our one in the museum uh, has lots of evidence of a par parasitic infestation of the the original uh, creator, shall we say. Uh, I believe it's uh, whipworms and more worms. Yeah. Parasitic then, worms. So very interesting yeah, stuff. A bit different to the fancy it. ear spoon. <laughs> no, uh, you said you'd see diet from that, right? Yes. I believe that the Lois Bank showed mostly meat and bread. Yes. Mm. So we haven't done an analysis of that one in particular, but they've done isotopic analysis of some um, skeletal inhumation graves from the city of Sigtuna. And Several of those individuals, well, they appear to be almost sticking to what today call a vegetarian diet. Mostly uh, barley, rye, different kinds of grains that they're growing. Uh, presumably, they are subsistence farmers. They eat what they grow, and they only, well, only they mostly eat meat during the Yule or Christmas feast, for instance. Uh, the Christmas ham probably has roots in the Viking Age tradition of the Yule Feast. You have a, you're going to have an idea of how much food is left to survive the winter, and therefore you can pig out a little. Mm -hmm. Speaking of feasts inside the hall, most of us imagine these, you know, guttering torches, dimly illuminating uh, the Viking Age halls. That may be slightly erroneous. Primarily, because we don't have a lot of evidence for torches from the Viking Age. Mostly, we see either light from hearths, of course, also serving as cook fires, but also from oil lamps. Hmm. Yeah, we've got an image of one on display right now, yeah. Uh, we have um, several examples of these from Coppergate, the size of Jorvik Viking Center. Um, some of ours are actually made out of pieces of old Roman masonry, I believe, that they've Ooh. hollowed out and uh, poured some sort of fat to burn inside. But presumably it's not Roman masonry up in Scandinavia. No, that, that'd be a bit is, exotic. Brilliant. This is clay, just pretty crudely made. We do find these kinds of uh, lamps in iron as well, uh, primarily from Norway, if I remember correctly. Uh, these would have provided... Uh, more or less stable illumination in comparison to the torchlight. But recently, Danish archaeologists did a study which showed that in a few different halls from Viking Age Denmark, very high status ones, there may have been glass panes in the windows to let in light. Really? Wow. We don't often think of, of glass windows in the Viking Age, do we? <laughs> and uh, combined with uh, the descriptions of the halls being uh, shining or possibly whitewashed, they would have been reasonably comfy to live in, mm. I'd imagine at least. Now, it's also in these urban environments where we find uh, sources of some of the most exotic uh, contexts that we have during the Viking Age. And I believe that the easternmost trade could found in Viking Age Scandinavia are several pieces of Tang Dynasty silk, having made its way here all the way from what's not China. The image uh, that I hope uh, yes, we've got the image up now. Screen, excellent, uh, is from a grave of from Birka, and archaeologists believe there's some form of headband or hairband with uh, damask silk and a piece of uh, silver postament sewn on as well. Mm. So this would have been a very high status object. Uh, but it's, the silk doesn't stop in Scandinavia, right? Yeah, we, I've actually got a replica of one of the silk objects that was found on Coppergate here. 
Now, that's really interesting that the, the, the example uh, you've got there for us to show is, is Tang Dynasty uh, China, because I don't think ours is, is from China, but it's a, a type of cap or hood we think a Viking woman may have worn. Um, probably Western Asia, Eastern Mediterranean, we believe that um, ours originally came from. Uh, there were other strips of silk found at Hoppergate as well, and I believe a small uh, pouch with a cross embroidered on it, um, presumably for some sort of um, relic or like a souvenir from a pilgrimage. But this was the largest uh, near-complete item that we've got a replica of just here, uh, with little fasteners at the bottom to tie it under your neck. Um, so yes, silk would have been quite... Quite exotic, wouldn't it, in this part of the world in the Viking Age? <laughs> so, uh, what do the Scandinavians do to, well, import silk? Well, they sell stuff. And what do they sell? Well, there's furs. For some reason, they become incredibly popular as a fashion in the Caliphate, centered around both Baghdad and Samarkand, the Abbasid and the Samanid Caliphate, respectively. Uh, they also sell what the uh, Arabic sources or Islamic sources call Frankish blades. But the pound for pound, uh, the most valuable trade goods, presumably slaves, thralls. And thralls, they're almost invisible in the archaeological record. Uh, presumably, they don't get a lot of burials. We have some secondary burials, some is called deviant burials, people with bound hands or feet, decapitated secondary burials, and of course the famous inscription from Ibn Fadlan that talks about a slave girl who volunteers to take part in a dead chieftain's funeral pyre. Uh, we're not sure how voluntary that actually is, but he describes it in that way. Yeah, it's, it's quite a harrowing description, uh, that particular account, isn't it? Mm. It is, it is. Uh, read it if you're interested. It, it's fascinating. And the discussion, of course, as always, is ongoing. But most of the stuff that he describes has some parallels in the archaeological record from Viking Age Scandinavia and well, uh, well, the Old Norse world, let's put it like that. And these are neck fetters. Oh. Yeah, we have an image of... Uh... Those on display now. Uh, oh, so yeah, we have nothing like this from uh, the, the current archaeological archaeological record mm -hmm. from York. So, as you said, uh, the existence of of slaves in the Viking Age and in where we are here, they, they're invisible to us, but we know they must have been here. Uh, we have passing mentions of slaves in Anglo-Saxon documents. Uh, the Doomsday Book at the very end of the Viking period also has some kind of tallies on the proportions of the statuses of different people. So Ooh. we know slaves exist in the area, but th they don't leave obvious objects Ooh. behind for us to identify, mm. and, and the human remains aren't particularly easy to identify social status sometimes in the absence of grave goods. So th these are very interesting finds mm. here. These are from Birkja, I believe a similar pair was recovered in Heidebu, done in Denmark, and some from Dublin as well, but, uh, but don't quote me on that one. Uh, as for the, we know that the Scandinavians sold huge amounts of slaves during the Viking Age, but the actual proportion of them living in the homelands is under debate. I've seen as uh, low estimates as maybe 5-10%, or some truly outrageous claims of them being, you know, 40%. and. We can't tell because they're so hard to track, but we can probably reasonably say that Viking Age Scandinavia was a slave society, or a thrall society. Mm. It's it's interesting when um if if you if you uh, if anyone's read some of the Icelandic literature out there, the sagas, just how classist the Vikings come across as well. Um, the just the strange way that they talk about their thralls and um people being referred to as like, oh, well, your, your father was a freed slave, so... Mm, yeah, um, social standing is everything for, mm. to these people. We, we got evidence of people dueling to the death over perceived slides in table placement in feasting halls. Mm -hmm. So if, if that comes to blows, imagine what something like lineage and patrimony and inheritance can bring. Mm. 
occasionally I, I've seen examples in some of the sagas where they go, oh yeah, my parent was a slave, but their parent was like Irish royalty, so very common. I think about <laughs> it. <laughs> Most famously, probably uh, Melkovka from yes. the Icelandic sagas, <laughs> the famous Irish princess who was taken as a slave to Iceland. Uh, genetically speaking, uh, the modern-day population of Iceland in the male genome, the part of the DNA passed down along the male lineage, is about 80% Norse, Scandinavian in origin. But 65 to 75% of the female genome is Celtic in or origin, Northern British Isles. And the traditional explanation, together with the Icelandic sagas, was always that the exiled chieftains fleeing from Harald Fairhair's tyrannical rule of Norway uh, they leave their women back home, they go over to the British Isles, get new uh, wives, new slaves, and then they settle Iceland. This interpretation has been questioned quite a bit, and presumably a lot of this Celtic DNA stems from second or third generation settlers of the British Isles, who then move over to Iceland. As for the actual colonization of Iceland, recently there's been some very exciting discoveries showing that there was activity on the island from at least the beginning of the 9th century, way before the traditional starting date of 874. Oh, sorry, uh, we're getting a bit uh, off track here. The What they bring back from these um, slaving expeditions or selling, the results of the slaving expeditions, is silver. There is a truly ridiculous amount of silver here in, well, in the northern Europe. If we take together what is now uh, Russia, Poland, uh, the Baltic states, Scandinavia, Iceland, England, somewhere between 400,000 coins, most of them minted, or Arabic coins, most of them minted in Central Asia, uh, associated with the Samanid Caliphate. I believe we have some of them on an image here. Yes, we've got a selection of some lovely dirhams on display here. Mm. Um, I've got a replica of the the one <laughs> that was found at uh, Coppergate. Uh, our one, interestingly, whilst it is from the 10th century, uh, the one on display in the museum, um, the, the one that's on display, it's not actually made of silver like they're supposed to be. It seems to be a 10th century imitation of a Central Asian dirham. <laughs> um. the, uh, some of the dirhams on display are also uh, imitations, but they are good silver. The center one, as you see, with the uh, eagle, the bird on it, mm. has often been speculated to have been minted in uh, what is now Ukraine or Russia by one of the Kievan Rus or Rus princedoms popping up there. Uh, they really like Arabic coinage, but the bird symbol is always associated with them. Mm. Now, we often think about Christianity being one of the uh, driving factors of the end of the Viking Age. But numerically speaking, the non-Christian religious messages we find in Viking Age Scandinavia outnumber the Christian finds. And that's primarily due to these dirhams. Uh, you have you assumed in picture there? Yes, the, the coin on the, the bottom right of that selection we have, we've highlighted, yes. Yes, I think it's upside down. So the upper or the lower two rows for your end, they said... Uh, Muhammad Rasul Allah, uh, apologies for my terrible Arabic, but it essentially translates to uh, uh, Muhammad the Messenger of God or Muhammad the Prophet of Allah, and that's part of the, well, the, the, the creed almost. I, mm. There's a word for it, I can't remember it right now. And most of these are stamped not only with uh, which Sultan is in charge, uh, where it was minted, but also with the surahs as well, passages from the Quran. Hmm, interesting. So, um, imported objects like these dirhams, uh, with the text and the imagery that's religious in nature, they hint at these trade routes, uh, not just bringing objects into Scandinavia, but being a route for new ideas, new philosophies, and new religions as well. Um, but the big one, I suppose, in the, the story of, of the later Viking Age is the Christianization of Scandinavia. So, so. What, what can you tell us about that? Uh, it's a let's say, call it a long and rocky road. Uh, the earliest mentions of missionary activity into Viking East Scandinavia is actually one of you guys, a Northumbrian monk or bishop, 
can't quite remember which one. He's been missioning among the Frisians, the people in living what is now the Netherlands. And he traveled up to what is now Germany, back then Denmark, and brought back with him uh, young boys, uh, presumably thralls, purchased or freed, to train as missionaries to return back to their homelands. Late, slightly after that, uh, in the age 20s, you have uh, the Vita Anskari, or the life of Anskar, describing Anskar's missionary activities and short-lived congregation on the Birka in the Mala River Valley. And this goes a bit back and forth. Um, exiled kings or nobles from Scandinavia, they like to go and seek help from uh, various Anglo-Saxon and Frankish kingdoms, and in return, they usually baptized, um, of course. But uh, it really kicks off with Harold Bluetooth. Uh, yes, of Bluetooth fame. Harold the Blotton is his name. We don't know exactly what the name refers to. He may have had a prominent rotten tooth. He may have had a taste of blood. Or the, the funniest explanation, which is probably completely wrong, is that he really liked blueberries. <laughs> now, uh, we find a lot of Christian well, crosses, iconography from Viking Age Scandinavia. And uh, mm. this one here, the image that you have, yeah. is probably, or what sometimes called, the first Scandinavian crucifix. And it's made in a local style, but clearly showing uh, someone, presumably Jesus, being crucified. There's some nice details here. Uh, the Scandinavians, they know how to execute someone by crucifying them. You'll see how his hands, rather than being nailed to the cross, they're tied. Oh yeah, I hadn't noticed that. <laughs> and this is so that uh, the person being crucified uh, drowns in their own lungs rather than ripping their hands off the nails. Oh, I felt bad for laughing just then, so I hadn't noticed that. Oh, <laughs> it, it may be a depiction of uh, uh, sleeves as well. But if you compare the depiction of the upper torso with the legs, it doesn't look like he has cloth on the upper torso. Hmm. But they also import some imagery. Uh, the image right now you're seeing is uh, encolpium. It's sort of a, a reliquary cross thing. And it's presumably of either uh, Kiama Rus make or Byzantine make. Mm, Again, it, It's very orthodox Christianity, this style, doesn't it? It's, mm. Precisely. Again, showing a crucified man wearing only a loincloth or trousers. And on the other side, there's some selected saints presumably being shown. I can't identify them. Um, but they also produce some fascinating objects. There's a stone from Denmark where you have, we don't have an image of this, I just need to mention it. We have three slots for casting uh, what presumably are pendants. Two are crosses and one of them is a hammer of Thor. And so this guy, he was profiteering on both sides. And the wearing of Mjolnir amulets, we know it's a hammer. They found a hammer in Denmark where it says, this is a hammer. Yes, I'm familiar I, with that one, yes. I, I love <laughs> like, it. Hammer is. <laughs> mm -mm. But uh, picture number 18, I think, shows a hammer of Thor, pendant or amulet, with a dot decoration resembling a christian cross and we think there's a lot of synchronicity going on especially if the king is trying to christen uh, the lad he shows up at your farm asks you are you christian you're gonna say yes because otherwise he kills you and takes your farm but when he leaves how christian are you really and we see this in the icelandic sagas which talks about the christianization of iceland it's a demographic get democratic decision at the other thing or thing and there they're going to become officially christian but they're going to have three exceptions one you can keep on putting out children or babies to the elements you can keep on eating horse flesh and you can keep on sacrificing to the old gods or practicing the old ways literally as long as you do it in private a don't ask don't tell policy it's an interesting uh, three primary points to select, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> the eating of horses was actually banned by a pope back in the seventh century when the Franks were becoming Christian because it's so heavily associated with pre-Christian Germanic ritual. Hmm. 
Interesting. Yeah, I think in, in England we still have a, uh, a squeamishness about the idea of horse meats, but in other countries they're quite happy to eat it. Yeah. It is really good. I like mine served as a ribeye, per se, <laughs> but I'm Icelandic, so don't take too much from that. Now, uh, one of the last images for today is a baptismal font from the island of Gotland. And it's actually uh, if in a shape reminiscent of the English baptismal fonts. So presumably someone was over there being inspired by them. And as you can see here, they've got some very nice crosses on them, clearly Christian iconography. But then on another side, you have a runic inscription. Yeah, this looks more like your sort of classic rune stone, doesn't it? With the, the runes and there's a sort of serpent-like imagery as well. Yeah, you see there's uh, some in an individual in a pit of serpents. It would be really cool if this was Ragnar Lothbrok being thrown into a pit of snakes, but presumably it depicts one of the many saints who kings try to execute by throwing them into a pit of snakes, but the snakes won't bite them. There's a lot of these stories. But the runic inscription doesn't say anything interesting. It just says the typical Sven made me. Mm -hmm. Classic. A, a maker's mark, if you will. Yeah. Mm. The, uh, the the pit of snakes. So there's another example. I th I want to say it's Saga of the Volsungs, I believe, mm. and uh, I can't remember which hero it is. It might be Helgi, but don't quote me on that. He gets thrown in a pit of snakes with his hands tied up, and he plays a lyre with his toes, which mm. calms the uh, snakes. But I cannot see a lyre by his toes here, so I don't think it's him either. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So um, that's really, really interesting. We've got all this lovely selection of objects. I suppose um, the the Vikings, from what you've shown us, seem like ra rather nice guys then with all these lovely <laughs> treasures coming in and um, the, the conversion to Christianity. They've made this beautiful baptismal font. We do have one uh, final image, I believe, though, uh, to show. Uh, which is a little, little, little bit darker, isn't it, this mm. one? Mm. So, uh, the most common type of body modification associated with the Vikings are tattoos. Uh, I'm guilty of this uh, myself. I got some a Viking penny. Oh, I can't show this here, but it's a raven here. Oh, yeah, I know that one, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, there's only one mention of this, Ibn Fadlan, talking about how the rules are decorated uh, with lines of black and green and blue. But the one we have archaeological record of is actually the filing of the teeth. And we have an image we can show of that. Uh, just, just to warn interviewers, this is a, a image of human remains, just, just in case anyone uh, is a bit upset by that. We're going to show that image now of human remains. The, you see the grooved lines of the teeth. Mm. And so... there's... I've heard of this before, but never actually seen uh, the, the, the original archaeological example of this. Hmm. We don't know exactly what it means, but presumably uh, you fill these grooved lines with pigment, possibly something striking like red or black. Interestingly, several, a lot of the skulls found with this modification have been found in these deviant burials, or sometimes interpreted as thralls. So maybe some kind of way of identifying thralls. So that as long as, long as you have your mouth open, people can see that you're a slave. But mm. others have been found in perfectly normal, as normal as Viking graves get. Uh, we don't know, but it would have been very striking. And some people uh, pointed out that this is very painful. And I could imagine, yeah. And that, that's um, quite horrific, the idea of being permanently... It's, it's not even quite scarred. It's worse than being scarred, I think, isn't it? We, um, I think possibly in, I don't know if popular culture is the right term, but ideas about sla slavery in other time periods, the idea of like enslaved people being branded the same way cattle might be, but the idea of having your teeth scored into like this permanently is horrible. Hmm. Uh, I think I've only ever heard this before in the context of people trying to show the Vikings are fearsome. Look at their teeth. Yeah, but that's another one. Having theory. it inflicted upon you. Hmm. Not very nice at all. <laughs> so that's been a really, really interesting um, selection of objects you've shown us there. And we've had some nice parallels to some of our finds here from Viking Age York. 
and I see we've actually got a few questions that have come through Ooh, from really? our audience. So let's see our first question. Um, oh, also, I should say we've got a list of where our viewers are from as well. I've got viewers from Belgium, Canada, Stockholm, uh, Scotland, York, and North Allerton, just up the road from York. Lovely. <laughs> Um, so our first question is, uh, what is the most common misunderstanding about Swedish Vikings? I really like to bring up the idea that the Swedish Vikings didn't exclusively head eastwards and that they most definitely didn't just trade eastwards. There's plenty of historical records of them raiding eastwards as well, as far away as modern day Georgia or Iran. Really? Wow. Mm. Down in the Caspian Sea. I Most think... famously, the expedition of Ingvar Vitfarne, which mm. ended horribly. There's like 10, 15 runestones mentioning people who died together with Ingvar. Mm. So, yeah, we have this kind of, um, I, guess, I guess, a bit of a trope that the Vikings have compass directions that each nation kind of points in effectively. Uh, but it's much more complicated than that, ultimately, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Um, our next question is, um, what is both of our favourite artefacts or historic items? So I presume they're referring to Viking ones specifically. They've not outright said that, though. So if you do have a favourite non-Viking artefact, Ooh, that, that that might, you could mention that, I suppose. But I'll leave it up to you. <laughs> that's a very, very difficult question. There, there's so many to choose from. One that I particularly like, uh, a Viking Age example, it's um, similar to this. It's a comb case that was found in Lincoln. So uh, for those who don't know, Lincoln's another town in England, uh, south of York. And they often have this lovely decoration on them. But this particular one from Lincoln has runes on it in uh, Younger Futhark. And um, we don't have a lot of Younger Futhark runes here in England. So we're really happy when we find anything that has lo something like that on it. And it says, uh, Thorfast makes good combs. <laughs> and I like to imagine that that's like some sort of branding, that maybe this is just one of hundreds that would have existed, mm. a bit like having Adidas or like Nike written on it or something like that. Uh, maybe Thorfast had, had his own brand, his little logo. And um, just the idea that, that that's one, one craftsman's name that has survived on a or an object, because the people that we uh, have depictions of at Jorvik on our Coppergate ride, we actually don't know the names of anyone who lived in Viking Age Coppergate. All the characters are kind of hypothetical, based upon the crafts and trades, but they know that somewhere around Viking Lincoln, Thorfast was making combs. <laughs> that is very interesting, because um, studies on the comb making has tried to link uh, different comb styles with itinerant craftsmen, because you can't just stay in one place and make coats. You have to move around. The market, this market is too saturated to be able to stay in one place. So presumably branding your coats would have been a great marketing strategy. And I'm going to riff a little on that by talking about, you know, a, an off-brand Ulfbert sword. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with the Ulfbert swords? Yes. Some sort of like master blacksmith who made these amazing blades that are found all over Europe, branded with his name upon them. We find some of these blades with badly misspelled or even just imitation in, um, inlays in them, and often of very inferior quality. So either someone is maliciously producing knockoffs, or someone has completely misunderstood the meaning of the inlay and thinks it has some kind of magical properties so mm. thus by putting them on an inferior sword it would uh, improve it mm. that's really interesting uh, our next question uh, ties back to what we were talking about at the very start of the discussion uh, do we think do, do you think that uh, the rather new and unexpected archaeological findings in Estonia will change our take on for instance when the Viking Age started or in some other aspects? Uh, the uh, finds at uh, Sarma have well, pretty much already been incorporated into at least uh, Swedish thinking about the Viking Age, partially because it lines up really well with the foundation of Birka and the uh, archaeological start of the Viking Age. Uh, but even then, there's no really clean breaks. You can make several different arguments. 
one I particularly like is that it just bypasses the differentiation between, well, your Anglo-Saxon period, our Vandal period, and the Vikings just puts it as younger Iron Age because it's a clear continuation there. Mm. Yeah, I think in, in, in um, po- popular kind of understanding of history, we, we have these very kind of firm dates in our mind, don't we? Um, like, you know, in, in, in um, Britain, we have the year 410, as that's the end of the Roman Empire, as if in your calendar, Romans ended, uh, Anglo-Saxons <laughs> began. But we know that Roman culture is continuing in some form well after that day, it's an Anglo-Saxon is only trickling in. Um, so it, it shows how kind of fluid and flexible those kind of quite kind of arbitrary in some cases divisions that we, we place upon them are. Um, and we've got, was there a drop in import of gold in the Viking Age? It seems to me that in the pre-Viking Age, uh, Vendel, they used way more gold. Or due to silver imports, gold was put aside? Uh, we do find a lot of gold from the Viking Age. It just drowns in the truly ridiculous amount of silver, silver that we have here. Remember, these the 400,000 or so silver coins... These are the reported fraction of the uncovered fraction of the unrecovered fraction of the deposited fraction of the imported fraction. There must have been truly outrageous amount of silver coming in. And when the uh, Durham import drops off in the 950s and 960s due to a debasement of the coinage due to silver mines running out, Scandinavians turned to England, but primarily Germany. They've just opened a new silver mine in Saxony, in the Ottonian Empire. And this is also when the Scandinavians start striking their own silver as well. Mm. Uh, there's just so much more silver rather than a decrease in gold. What there is, though, that after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, the uh, amount of gold found in deposits uh, goes down, presumably due to Romans no longer mining out the gold mines and sending it up to different barbarian tribes to appease them, hire them as mercenaries, etc., etc., etc. It's interesting mentioning just then the uh, the silver being sourced from, from England. I'm, I'm sure I, I've read somewhere that the coins of the early 11th century, kind of uh, Ethelred the Unready period, we find more of his coinage in Denmark than we do in England, <laughs> interestingly. You just need to look at the uh, uh, prices of the Danielt mm. or Gathol, which goes from like £35,000 up to over £100,000 towards just before Sven Forkbid and King Knuth conquers England. Mm. Um, we've got, I think, one final question we've just got enough time for. Mm. Uh, we have a rough idea of the interaction between pagan Viking religion and Christianity. If the Vikings were trading with Muslim nations, what might that cultural interaction have looked like? Uh, we don't know, but presumably uh, they find local interpreters. Uh, Ibn Fadlan, he talks and it gets stuff explained to him by an interpreter. Presumably a veteran trader has picked up some of the language. And you're probably seeing um, several lines of interpreters between these high-status individuals. I've read oh. uh, s- some of the translations of Arab accounts as well that mention uh, Slavic interpreters specifically. Yeah. Mm. Um, and I, th- I think there's even mentions they, they pr- pretend to be Christians because uh, Islam has um, allowances for Judaism and Christianity, but less so for people who uh, ritually sacrifice people to Odin. <laughs> it's for tax reasons. Mm. You tax pagans harsher than you tax Christians, and you tax Christians harsher than you tax well, local Muslims. Great, so we're nearly out of time now. Uh, I see on our list of uh, viewers, also the Czech Republic's been added to that list as well. Very good, influence. very good. Uh, so, great, that's been uh, really interesting. Thank you for mm-hmm. answering my questions and our audience's questions. Uh, of course, it's been I really a really enjoy it. 
It's been a really fascinating discussion. Um, thanks for all the wonderful information. And also thank you to all of our viewers around the world who have joined us for this live stream. Uh, if you joined us part way through, uh, we should be making a recording of this that will be available on demand uh, so you can watch the entire conversation. Um, if anyone's interested in, interested in learning more about uh, the museum where Askia works, um, do, do check out their website, thevikingmuseum.com, as well as their social media channels. They've got some wonderful stuff on there. So thank you once again for joining us this evening, Asker. Thank you. It was a and, pleasure. Excellent. And thank you, viewers. And goodbye, everybody.